Hello there, and welcome to this video guide to the one in black, focusing on the themes and techniques, just some of the themes and some of the techniques. I and mean, one thing to say about any of these video guides, and indeed any video guide or guide of any description is they're just that, they're guides. They are by no means exhaustive. They are by no means um, the only way of looking at things. And it's really, really important that as a student that you develop your own ideas, provided they are reasonable, feasible, backed up by evidence, what you think is valid and important. The aim with this um, series of videos, and indeed any video or document that I would produce, is to just point you at some of the things that I have spotted and try and in some respects, show my thinking process so you can learn how to get to that process yourself so that you can come up with your own ideas. So there is nothing here that is exhaustive or exclusive. There are other things that can be talked about. These are just some of the things that you might consider when looking at the novel. So as a ghost story, um, the themes are relatively straightforward. Um, loss, tragedy, the supernatural all come in there. There is some social commentary. It's not always foregrounded, but it is there and it's important. Um, and technique wise, actually, there are a, a number of techniques, a handful that, that um, Helm deploys fairly widely. Again, I'm not going to go over every little thing that she does in this in this uh, video guide. Um, I've already actually spent quite a bit of time in the individual chapter guides going through some of these things anyway. But again, even then, it's not exhaustive. There will be things that I haven't touched upon. There will be sentences that you think, why no, I haven't you included that one? That, that, that line there is amazing. Or that page on that, that chapter where this thing happens, you don't reference that. It's because it's not complete. It never is. I'm just picking out some of the things that I think are important. So we're going to start to have a look at the themes. Uh, and because it is a story that's a ghost story and it works within the Gothic tradition, um, the clearest, most obvious themes kind of relate to that, the idea of fear, isolation, and the idea of the past. Um, there's a really nice section on BBC Bite Size about that, actually. And that covers them pretty well, and there's a, a nice little video to accompany that. So let's have a start in reverse order. Let's have a look at the past and memory. This is very important to the Gothic tradition. And the whole novel really is about the past. It's either Arthur's past or the past of Eel Marsh House and Jeanette Humphrey. In each case, the past invades the present. Now, this is a very typical Gothic trope. It's a feature of the Gothic novel where the past comes in and it disrupts the current. Uh, in Arthur's case, it's the memories of the past that invade his present happy new life. And remind him that his old life is still there and it is capable of well, I mean, there's some suggestion that it's capable of, in fact, ending his happiness and ending his life, in fact. And uh, this retelling of these events does seem to, there's a suggestion that this seems to have brought about Arthur's demise. Uh, in the case of Eel Marsh House, it's the events of the, the past, the hunt, the, the, the haunting, uh, the death of Je Jeanette Humphrey's son and Nathaniel's subsequent madness death and that, but that haunt the place. These are echoes of past things. If we think about what the pony trap is, the sound of the pony and trap. This is the event from 60 or so years ago that plays out over and over and over again. It's that memory, the idea that the past is there and it's invading. So Arthur's constantly revisiting his past in chapter one. He remembers the first time he sees Monk's Peace. He remembers his working life with Mr. Bentley. He recalls his early engagement to Esme, then moved to the house. All of this kind of is a precursor to the retelling of the terrible events, because as Arthur says, he'd always known that he would that it would never leave him, and that it was just so much a part of him that it was never going to go away. But he'd hoped that he'd be able to bury it. And the one in black is trapped in her own personal hell, presumably. Um, uh, kind of unable to let go, perfectly understandable, given the kind of the force of the events and what we learn in the story. She's driven mad by this psychological trap of, of, of this terrible, terrible event that occurs that she just can't, as I say, understandably escape from. And even Arthur remarks uh, on this, that the whole episode or a shadow or memory of it somehow happened again and again. 
and he says, you know, she's she, she's there. She's she's visiting on others what had been visited on her. The wickedness that led her to take away the other women's children because she lost her own was understandable, but not forgivable. And that is the heart of this. That, and, and it's a really clever trick that we don't just go, oh my god, this just she's just a terrible, horrible force. There's something eerily understandable we can relate to that you can imagine that it's not a logical response it's not even a reasonable response but it is an understandable response to that tragedy and Ilmarsh House itself is a representation of the past in fact the entire novel is a representation of the past we don't know when it's set the time frame is difficult to pin down it's in the past we're not sure there are telephones and motor cars but then there's steam trains and pony traps we have a victorian christmas presented to us decades after these things but it all feels old it all feels from the past and neil marsh house feels like it's from the past it feels like it comes out of a victorian novel arthur even remarks at one point it felt like he was in a victorian novel he is basically um and Ilmarsh House itself is this. It's this memory box from a previous life. We see that it is full of items from, from years and years ago. And of course, it's haunted by someone who was trapped in their past. And there's the setting, as I say, like I said, it's somewhere in the past, but we just don't know when. Then you've got isolation. And thematic there, isolation is... It's a key feature of ghost stories in the Gothic. Um, isolation is illustrated throughout the novel, through Arthur's experiences, but also through the kind of social and cultural isolation of the Drablo sisters. Arthur's physically isolated. He can't get help. Um, he's then further isolated on the Marsh house. Um, he's socially isolated. He kind of socially isolates himself because of his attitudes. And he is... When we meet him, he is to an extent still, even though he is clearly part of the family, he's in a, uh, an environment where he is loved and he has people around him who he loves, he is still separated from them by his past. He is still isolated. Jeanette Humphrey is isolated. Her status as a single mother isolates her. She is a pariah in the town. In fact, that's a, a, a word that gets used to describe her. Um, she becomes a living embodiment of the shame that society places upon her when she becomes the woman in black. She is this outsider who dared to have a child out of wedlock, and now look what has happened. And Alice Drablo, interestingly enough, we, did, we I haven't talked enough about Alice Drablo probably in, in these videos, and, and I think we don't often think about her, but Alice Drablo herself tries to do as much as she can, but is isolated by this tragedy that um, is imposed upon her. There's no real mention of her. She's just expected to step up and, and look after a child. She takes on the responsibility, does bring a child up as her own, and um, ultimately is left alone and isolated with nothing but the ghost of her dead sister to keep her company. And then that what a what a terrible, terrible situation Alice must have endured. Arthur's physical isolation is most obvious as he travels away from London. It gets less comfortable and less pleasant. And it's obvious when he crosses the Nine Lives Causeway. But as I say, we've got this interesting thing where he just cannot connect with the, the, the local people, particularly once they, they realize what he's there for. It's an example here of the 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 farmer who he's having a quite a pleasant conversation with otherwise just turns away from him at the end but in part it's his own attitudes that he has a londoner sense of superiority and again this is a nice quotation here that illustrates jeanette humphrey's situation uh and, and how 
she had no choice about giving her sister uh, her, her son to bring up. And as I say, Alice Drablo uh, is left out of this. Um, she's blamed by her sister. <sighs> Not... Uh, I was going to say not unreasonably, but it is unreasonable to blame her, but it's perfectly understandable that someone will be lashing out. It's not uh, Alice's fault. Alice did what she thought was right in the context, looked after um, Jeanette's son and uh, loved, presumably loved him. I mean, if we look at the nursery, the nursery was a construct. The nursery is an interesting one because the nursery is not something that Jeanette put together. It's something that Alice put together. That's the room that Alice's adopted son lived in. So what you see there is an expression of Alice's love. And it's interesting, like I said, that that kind of gets passed over. And she's left with no one to mourn her passing. And it's a no, no blood relative or heart's friend. Fear, of course, is a key theme in the novel. Uh, it's laced throughout. It's the big one. It's the theme that's there, and it's the main aim of this novel. And I think uh, it, there's an excellent job done in this novel. There are some genuinely scary bits in this story. At least I find them so. There's a the physical fear for Arthur. Um, uh, various times he does appear to be physically in danger, particularly when we get to chapter 10. The psychological and the fear of the supernatural, the implications of malign spirits are so unsettling to Arthur and actually to the reader. The idea that ghosts are out there is a bad thing. Ghosts with a particularly vengeful bent in this instance. Um, there's the existential threat. And this is something that I've talked about before and I'll talk about again. One of the things that upsets Arthur is that he understands the world. The world is like this. It's built like this and these things happen and they proceed from logical series of kind of, he, he has this view of an almost clockwork universe which follows rules. And this is completely fractured. Uh, and when he has his worldview pulled out from under him, he has a nervous breakdown. And uh, you've also got the fear of the unknown, which is something that um, is played upon quite heavily through the use of the noises. So physical danger, Arthur is trapped. And then he hears something terrible happening to the pony trap. Someone's dying. We're worried for Arthur because we think, oh, if he traces out the, onto the, into the marsh, he'll, he'll suffer the same fate. And Arthur, of course, contemplates that himself. And again, the inability to deal with a situation is something that brings about a, a psychological impact. And here's a, a, a good example. It's an example that I think is worth looking at. The idea of that I was all was so changed, so utterly changed that I might have been reborn into another world. So this is when Arthur is, is sort of contemplating everything that's happened to him and everything just to him feels different. The world has changed and shifted. There's another layer of reality, and that is leaving him vulnerable to the psychological stresses uh, of the events that surround him. And then, of course, we've got the unknown. The door is a brilliant use because on the other side of it, we don't know what it is. And it's just illustrated by a simplistic sound that could be a heartbeat. It could be anything we don't know. And our imagination fills that room with all kinds of horrors. Horrors that it turns out both are and aren't there. So there are a handful of other themes. And again, none of this is exhaustive. But I mean, I would uh, look perhaps at the treatment of women, social class, loss, and the role of parents. Many, many more things that you can consider. Lots of things that are touched on. But for instance, the role of, uh, of women, they occupy social niches uh, and are often not treated brilliantly. I mean, Jeanette Humphrey's treatment at the hands of her family and the people of Chris and Gifford is, is really obviously um, negative and arguably society has created its own ghost. It is society's actions that give rise to the woman in black. Social class, um, the idea of that there is a social order, that things happen, that um, we are deferential, that um, certain people are just better than other people. Uh, Arthur's own prejudice kind of kicks in there and, and leads him to ignore what should have been some fairly stark and obvious warnings. The idea of loss is laced throughout this novel. The, 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 the loss is the driver behind the events. It's the thing that uh, makes Jeanette Humphrey into the woman in black. It's the thing that breaks Arthur, ultimately. 
we think it's the hauntings. We think it's his experience with the woman in black. But ultimately, once you read to the last chapter, you realize it is not. It's the loss that he experiences as a result of being haunted by the woman in black that breaks him. And it's reliving that loss that destroys Arthur. It's not the, the hauntings or anything like that. The bit that he finds most difficult to write, the thing that he has to interrupt the narrative flow to tell us about is the loss of his wife and child. Hill herself has clearly experienced loss. We, if you read her biography, if you look at it, um, and again, I don't always think that you should be using a novel A as a historical artifact, although they can be, or B as a psychological exploration of the author, although they can be that too. Those are ways of looking at novels. I don't always think we should. I think we should bring our own interpretations and we bring as much to the novel as any author will. But those are useful ways of considering things. And it's impossible to ignore the fact that Hill herself has experienced the loss of a child. If you read her biography, you can see that that is the case. And you've got parents. So parents are involved in this. Parents and parenthood is there. Uh, Arthur reflects on his own childhood. We see Arthur as a parent, presumably a, a, a very positive experience, a good parent he seems to be he's spending time with his family and again this links directly to the to, to, to kind of the into the role of of women because women are still uh, seen in that primary caregiver role there but it's interesting that arthur does represent to an extent the role of a father we see jerome as well who's a father who's lost a child so techniques more extensive this section uh, worth having a look though so we have a range of techniques um that i've just briefly touched upon Let's just have a look then. We've got the pathetic fallacy. Um, I've covered this quite extensively, but the pathetic fallacy is really, really important. Arthur sets that out at the beginning of the novel. And then there's foreshadowing. So the foreshadowing is part of the structure of the novel, this catafora, where it's casting forward to things that are going to occur later. These cataphoric references to things that will happen somewhere down the line and this foreshadowing is part of the building up of a general sense of unease and suspense that carries on right the way throughout of the novel there are times when it's more tense and there are times when it's less tense we do get that dip in the middle with chapters seven and eight but still we cannot shed the feeling that things are not right and you've got anaphora as well repetition it's interesting that in the chapter in the nursery the word noise is repeated 15 times. It only occurs 25 times in the entire novel. So parallelism. This is another structural feature similar to anaphora that we see. Um, Hill does this all the time. Once you're aware of it, it's really difficult to ignore. She often does it in groups of three, as I've illustrated here, family, joy and merrymaking, love and friendship, fun and laughter. But equally, she does it in, in pairs at various stages. But you have this repetition of these actual structures here um it's interesting that one in chapter one is kind of set off against another set of three pairs of um phrases linked by a conjunction which are the opposite which are um abstract nouns that are the opposite of these ones they're negative ones um and and like parallelism above we see listing uh, often in groups of three as well, we see the writer um, talking us through lots and lots of detail, lots of layered things, often to do with, in this instance, the weather, but we also see it to do with Arthur's emotions and his experiences. And in with that, we see sentence length, the idea that you'll often find that long, complex sentence, and at the end of it, this hammer blow of this short sentence again it's an interesting one i picked out the use of the word door there the anaphora there to keep us focused naming naming what's in a name there's a lot in a name this is a dickensian technique certainly he if he didn't invent it he was certainly the past master of it it's something that we associate with him but it 
Hill makes extensive use of this. So we have Mr. Daly, the solid and the reliable. I mean, if you do a little bit of research, um, you even find out that some of the names have got even more connections than you might imagine. Jeanette Humphrey. Humphrey, Mother Humphrey, was a name of one of uh, three famous witches who were hung in Norfolk. Um in and around, I think it's the town of Witchford, uh, and they're actually quite famous locally around about there. Uh, and place names too. Think about them. Eel Marsh House doesn't sound very pleasant. Uh, Monk's Peace does. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the homophone play there, peace meaning just the piece of land, but peace meaning peaceful, as in uh, the emotion. Then we've got the frame narrative. Obviously, we've got the frame narrative here where it's a story within a story within a story. So there are multiple narratives. Arthur tells his story. Arthur's, here's Jeanette's story told through the letters. Mr. Jerome's story is revealed through Mr. Daly's discourse. And again, some, some more Jeanette's backstory is revealed there. So we have the story within the story within the story, very much a part of the Victorian, the Gothic, the ghost story, this idea of I need to set up a reason for you to hear this. It can't just be a thing that happens. And the first person narrator is part of this. Uh, one other advantage the first person narrator has is particularly the way this is structured because it's a frame narrative, first person. The narrator author, and I've mentioned this in, in some of the chapter videos, the narrator author is distinct from the character author. So the narrator author is able to supply detail that the character wouldn't have spotted at the time using hindsight, but also is able to kind of very analytically pick apart what they're thinking and feeling. And we go with Arthur on that journey and that creates a greater kind of level of empathy and we see a degree more of reflection than we would do otherwise. And the epistolary form again feeds into this, a part of the frame narrative, the idea that we are gonna find an artifact that will reveal things. In fact, the entire, the entire narrative is part of this because it's a, it's a manuscript that can only be read once the author has passed away um, is the idea. So giving it that false sense of reality, which at the same time, of course, we get that kind of suspension of reality when we don't know where or when it's set. But it's all part of making this kind of unreal journey into what could be a very real, uh, you know, it's meant to feel like it could have existed, it could have happened. Literary illusion. Again, this is just quite nice. This is one of these things that shows that the author is working within a particular tradition and has a particular understanding of the genre and keeps throwing out references to it which are great if you're a bit of a literary geek like me you just go oh gloomy ravens eh all at once i heard her rapping and we know that she's referencing edgar Allan poe's poem and the idea that hey, you've got the raven as a harbinger of doom harbinger in this case of of, of in, a descent into madness as well um, you've got a reference to Miss Havisham in chapter five, or Whistle and I'll Come to You, etc. And there's more, all, uh, more references throughout the throughout the novel. And symbolism stuff represents things. So birds represent warnings of danger. Um, the pony and cart represents the journey between worlds and danger. Spider is kind of representative of um, of 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 a child and represents danger. Well, spider is a plot device that brings Arthur in, into peril at various times. But, uh, you know, the, the, the symbols here represent something more. And you've got, a, you know, these two, the birds and the pony and the cart are really fairly consistent. I do think spider is important because spider is that substitute for the child. And I'm often left wondering that if Arthur, had, if the, the dog had been taken from Arthur, would that have been an end to the woman in black's revenge? I don't know. Obviously, it's a silly question because... That's not how that works. So sound imagery as well. Sound imagery, as we know, gets used at chapter six and nine and the semantic fields of terror. So we know that we have semantic fields right the way throughout the novel. Um, and it's hardly surprising. This is a ghost story where semantic fields that refer to um, negative, powerful negative emotions crop up throughout. So the next video is going to be about tackling the exam question. I hope that you found this a useful guide to some of the themes and the techniques that Susan Hill uses and engages with. Remember what I said, it's by no means exhaustive. And if you spot something and you can clearly see that it's there, then that's an important thing as well. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye.